Sam, Samantha, Sam, we call her Sam, is, uh, um, she is with the Door County Soil and Water Department, and her job is to focus on ecological restoration and invasive species management, and it, as part of that, she is a coordinator for DZIS, which is the Door County Invasive Species Team, and it's the neatest name ever. My mother always used to say, see some DZIS, and we're, that's what we're hoping will happen with all of our, our invasives. She holds a master's degree in sustainability science with a concentration in national, natural resources conservation from the University of Massachusetts. And rather than listen to me talk about her, let's listen to her talk. So Sam Quinn, take it from here and use your, use your outdoor voice. Oh, I will. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, Normally, whenever I talk about invasives, I feel like a lot of people don't want to come hear me talk, and you guys have proven me wrong, and I'm very excited that all of you are here. Um, so, our topic today is kind of backyard invasives, it's not all bad news. Uh, and, and I know that topic is, uh, the title is a little misleading. Um, so, I always feel like you have to start off and kind of introduce, uh, A, what the Door County Invasive Species Team is. No. <laughs> Which one? It's okay. <laughs> and then um, we sh need to cover what an in uh, invasive species is, is as well as uh, we need to dive into topics of how to recognize something that is potentially invasive. So I know it's going to shock you guys, we are going to dive in a lot on invasive species. But then we kind of start going to the next uh, topic, which is invasive species, or is it not? And it's a really interesting thing as we talk about time scale. Um, and then we end the whole conversation thinking about native species because who doesn't like native species? So, uh, as we dive in, uh, as Coggins said, I work as for the coordinator. I work as the coordinator for the Door County Invasive Species Team, and we are a collaboration of nonprofit uh, groups as well as dedicated citizens and also federal and state government and county entities, all focusing on managing invasive species here in the county. Um, and managing could be anything from prevention to controlling uh, to doing outreach and education. Um, and so that's why I'm here. And we are a recognized cooperative weed management area or a cooperative invasive species, ma uh, species management area or CISMA. Um, and that allows us to get federal and state grants. It's, uh, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, I know it just sounds like an acronym to you guys, but it's something that we like having that badge because that gets us money. Um, so when we talk about invasive species, or really any plants or animals, it's really important that we start the dialogue of how do we define these. Um, oftentimes I have landowners who will call and describe a plant and I realize, oh, that's a native plant that might be just weedy. Um, and so it's really important for us to have kind of an agreement of terms, especially for this topic. Uh, invasive species are defined as not native species that negatively impact the economy and or human health and or the environment. So that's really important to keep in your mind as we go through with this conversation. The next one, um, so an example of that is non-native Phragmites. If you've been in Door County long, I feel like you've probably heard about non-native Phragmites and it's been kind of ingrained in you as a Door County resident or visitor. Um, the next uh, examples when we talk about something that is naturalized. Uh, a naturalized plant is something that is non-native, but it's not invasive. So it doesn't have that negative impact that we see with invasive uh, species. And so a great example is broadleaf plantain. Uh, if you have a lawn and you're really meticulous about it, you may hate this plant. I think it's fantastic. Um, it was uh, brought over originally when um, the colonizers came through and uh, it oftentimes followed around um, people as they moved across the United States, and so it also got the nickname White Man's Foot. It's also used in traditional medicine. It's been in the Americas now for a very long time, but it doesn't create a dense monoculture. It doesn't have any of these negative impacts. So it's a great example of the naturalized species. The next is a weed. A weed is a native plant, but it's considered kind of annoying or a nuisance. Uh, and a great example of that is poison ivy. Uh, I oftentimes get lots of phone calls about poison ivy, and they end up not liking what I tell them, which is, it's native! <laughs> um, and so it tends to be one of the things that, um, it does serve an ecological purpose. Yes, as a person, it's really annoying. I now react terribly to it, um, but it does have its role in our environment. 
Uh, next is when we talk about cultivars, and this is where it gets really touchy. Um, cultivars are plants that are not native, um, but again, they don't really have a negative impact. And oftentimes, when we talk about any of these categories, it's kind of a sliding scale or a spectrum. Uh, and that's also really important to recognize. And so when we talk about cultivars, I always like using peonies as a great example. Uh, if you have peonies in your garden, you'll notice they don't really spread. You plant them in one spot and they've stayed there for, I don't know how long. I think about my mom's peonies that she had and she planted them probably when I was a toddler and they are still there and they have not moved and they have not spread. Um, and then we can talk about native ours. And so when we talk about native ours, uh, one of my favorite plants to point to is Echinacea. So Echinacea can come in all sorts of crazy colors. I mean, the amount of uh, kind of genetic variation that they've incorporated into this plant is crazy. Uh, but when we talk about native ours, it is important to recognize that they are selectively bred more often than not for specific characteristics for their appearances. And so oftentimes their pollen or nectar may not be as high quality. And so that's something that, you know, again, is worthwhile to consider, especially as we talk about these. So, we now have all of our terms. And again, just remember what an invasive species is. It is non-native and negatively impacts the economy, environment, and or human health. And so, when I talk about this, oftentimes people go, how negative is it? Well, 42% of the species listed under the Endangered Species Act are threatened by invasive species. And so, it's one of the things that, for us in our day-to-day -day lives, we may not notice it, but you all of a sudden start noticing our systems get more and more simplified. And so that's really, really bad. When we think about ash forests or anything else in our community, simplified systems are not that resilient. And we need that built-in resilience, so we need to keep our native species around. Um, invasive species alter ecosystem structure and function. A great example is if you think about the quagga and zebra mussels. Uh, think about how clear Lake Michigan is. It's crazy. Um, and as a result of them being great filter feeders, they end up increasing the light that can go through the water column. And that, in turn, increases the amount of algal blooms. And it ends up changing how nutrients cycle in the Great Lakes. And it has this huge cascading effect. Um, and then, you know, again, talking about zebra mussels, but they can also modify water and soil chemistry. I'm sure as master gardeners and also people who are avid in the outdoors around here, you can think of garlic mustard. Garlic mustard is aleopathic, meaning that it poisons essentially plants around it and impacts soil chemistry around it. So, I could keep going through all the horrors of the ecology, but essentially one of the big things is um, when we talk about sustaining our native systems, we really want to keep a diverse, robust system. And so we really want to maintain our diversity and ecological resilience. Next is the economy. So um, if you aren't someone who really loves the outdoors and our forests as is and our natural communities, one of the things that I can oftentimes sell people on is the impacts to your wallet. Uh, right now, invasive species, it's over $137 billion in the U.S. annually are spent on invasive species mitigation. That's an insane amount of money. Um, and a lot of it is not having to do with actual management, it's actually dealing with the impacts those have on our water infrastructure and our utilities and access. Um, and so when you look, uh, this photo right here with the water pipes, uh, that's um, from, I think, Lake Mead, Nevada, and that's quagga mussels uh, colonizing on a water pipe after six months, uh, which is crazy. Uh, and then when we look at this photo on the bottom left, that is Japanese knotweed weed growing through a brick wall. It can actually grow through cracks in cement and break through home foundations. Uh, we actually had an instance this year where we had it growing through a garage for, of someone. Um, so it's pretty destructive. Uh, there are places in the UK where they can't get homeowner's insurance because of it. Um, and so it's one of the ones, unfortunately, we do have in Door County and we're just trying to stay on top of. The next one is Japanese barberry. Uh, and Japanese barberry is really nasty and we can go right into the human health impacts of that one. Uh, Japanese barberry, they have found recently that forests with Japanese barberry in the understory are seven times more likely to carry Lyme disease carrying ticks. Um, and if that's not terrifying enough, there's a lot more neurological diseases that ticks carry that are coming in. So that's kind of a, makes my heart stop at least. Um, but we can also then go back to talking about quagga mussels and the increased algal, algal blooms 
and the impacts to our water quality as well. So, I know I said we're going to spin this all in a positive light, but I first had to sell you guys on the idea that invasives are bad and get you guys on the same page as me. So, uh, sorry for all of the bad news. Um, when we talk about invasives, one of the big things that we want to do is early detection. Early detection is one of the key components of dealing with invasives. Essentially, we want to prevent them before they become established. We want to be able to say, hey, they're not going to get here, and that makes our jobs easier. Um, and so, again, we're focusing on that main area. And how do you prevent things? You have to recognize how do they spread. Um, there are two main methods of introduction. It is intentional and unintentional introduction. And I know this is going to shock you, but humans are the primary means of spread when it comes to invasive species. Um, so unintentional introduction, in both of these, it may not be a nefarious decision. More often than not, somebody is bringing a plant or an animal that they love, they grew up interacting with, and that it's really important to them emotionally, and they bring it with them, or it's something they fell in love with, or something like that. And it's not that they're thinking, oh, I'm going to create the next ecological disaster in this area. More often than not, it's just a sweet token, and it ends up kind of being really destructive. So when we talk about intentional introduction, that's when somebody moves a plant from one place to another, or um, somebody is trying to not kill their son's turtle that they want at the fair, but they don't, want to, they don't know what to do, so they release it in a pond. Um, so that's intentional introduction. Unintentional introduction is not, um, you're not aware that you have a hitchhiker. So think about you know, the treads on your shoes, if you're walking through natural areas and you haven't cleaned your shoes. Or um, other unintentional introductions are your car can be a great vector for introducing new insects and seeds around, uh, which is a terrifying prospect, I know. Um, so when we talk about this, uh, I'm going to walk it back and test your guys' plant knowledge a little. Um, so this is a lovely planter box. Um, does anyone recognize those weeping plants? <laughs> Jenny. They are Creeping Jenny. Um, so Creeping Jenny, also known as Moneywort, is actually listed as a restricted species. And so we're going to dive into kind of what that means. But um, again, it's beautiful. It's, uh, I think Creeping Jenny is beautiful, but we do see it oftentimes showing up in planters boxes. Mm -hmm. And actually under Wisconsin state law, you can't even sell, trade, or give those plants away. Um, so it's... Mm -hmm. They do, but it's technically illegal, and so it's a violation under uh, the Department of Agriculture, Consumer Trade, and Protection. Um, it's an interesting thing, and we're going to dive into the topic of what are our current rules and regulations. So under Wisconsin state law, which is um, NR40, uh, that's the invasive species law in which we operate under, they have a whole bunch of regulated plants and animals. Uh, currently, there's 145 plants listed. Every five years, that plant list is updated. So some plants are removed from that list, some plants are added. Um, and it also includes what prevention steps individuals have to take. So it also includes uh, boater usage, um, fishing uh, requirements. It covers a whole bunch of stuff. It's a really lengthy rule if you end up reading through it. Um, and NR40, the important thing to uh, also look at is they sort these plants and animals into two categories, prohibited and restricted. Prohibited plants and animals are actually illegal to own. So you'll get a nasty gram from the DNR saying, you're going to get fined, you have to deal with this. Which is a crazy thing, because oftentimes landowners don't even realize that what they have is a bad thing. Um, and then there are these restricted plants and animals, and these are plants and animals that are a little bit more widespread throughout the state, and essentially you're not allowed to introduce them to new areas. So you can't share them, you can't, um, you can't transplant them, you can't give them to your neighbor, you can't sell them. Um, and so those are the two categories. And so when we talk about NR40, that rule, uh, they are focusing on that kind of prevention. So again, saying people have to clean boats and all that type of stuff. Uh, and then eradication is focusing on those prohibited species, those species where they say it's illegal to own, you have to deal with them, this is a huge red alert. And then they're also focusing on this containment, and those are the restricted species, the species that you can have if you already have them, but you can't share them. And so kind of foregoing what happens. One of the things when we talk about invasives, uh, 
I think oftentimes it's really difficult for people is what makes an invasive successful. And oftentimes I think when we start taking that step back, it actually helps people identify what are things that are potentially problematic. Um, and so I'm going to be annoying and open up to you guys and make you tell me what do you think makes an invasive successful and what makes an invasive kind of an invasive. Um, so, any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I think invasives um, have a degree of spread that becomes unwelcome. A degree of spread that is unwelcome. That is spot on. Anything else? <laughs> There's a lot of characteristics. Yeah. Um, our native uh, species don't eat them or keep them in check yep. because they're foreign to them and they haven't recognized them yet. Yep. So, so would you uh, put that under as like not having a predator or having uh, something that isn't focusing on it pretty much? Right. Okay. Uh, so we have two. I came up with nine by myself. So you guys got to do. Guys, got to put your thinking caps on here. Anything else? Allelopathic. Oh, yeah, characteristics that help them out compete. Um, as an individual, you might go and take care of it, but what do you do about your neighbor and the people around you that don't have the same interests? Okay. And that's hard. Yeah, yeah, that is tough. So, uh, again, having, um, would you say like people having not necessarily the same values or valuing that plant even if it is a problem? Right. Okay. Um, it has a characteristic where the leaves come out too early and stay too late, which then they prohibit their native ephemerals from coming up or Yeah, whatever. absolutely, yeah. Anything else? we got five. You guys are actually, you're much faster than I was. It may be tolerant of a lot of different conditions. Yep, tolerant of a lot of conditions. I like that. Can grow densely. Can grow densely. I like that. They can outcompete for um, resources and food. Outcompete for resources and food, okay. They, cre they create a lot of um, seeds or they reproduce themselves uh, aggressively. Okay, reproduce aggressively. Um, so we have nine. Anything else that you guys can think of? Because you actually thought of one or two that I didn't think of, so you guys are smarter than me. <laughs> Did someone say there are native um, insects and, and birds? Can't yeah, yeah. So we had, um, I believe we had the no uh, native predators. All right. Anything else? Because then I'm going to show off my list. All right. So we identified uh, they can grow in a variety of habitats. Uh, we identified pest slash predator free, can grow quickly, greens up early in the season and stays green longer, uh, uh, reproduces early and produces lots of offspring. Um, seeds have a high percentage of germination. This is where I came up with that one. Um, and I think you guys, I forget the one that you guys had, but there was a trade-off. Um, and then fruit is abundant and attractive to animals is another one. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good for them. It's just attractive to them. So they are also components in helping spread them. Um, and species has ornamental characteristics making it highly desirable. So talking about the neighbors and somebody seeing value in it. Um, and species is known to be invasive in other regions is one of the big ones. Um, and when we look at this list, um, initially you go, okay, this seems pretty obvious. But it is also an important lens when we start thinking about, when you go to a plant nursery, uh, I remember my mom is a very great gardener, very avid gardener. Um, and I always, <laughs> I like picking on her, she's not here to defend herself. Um, but she, uh, we would go to nurseries as a kid and she would always fall in love with these new ground covers. And she'd go, oh, this is gonna grow great in my shade garden. Nothing else is gonna grow underneath it. And it's brand new, no one else is gonna have it in the neighborhood. It's so exciting. And now, uh, going into the field that I did, I'm like, oh my gosh, my mom was like, one of the big people who was just spreading invasives around. <laughs> um, kind of crazy. And I, you know, as a kid, I was just like, okay, that sounds great, mom. Um, and so, it's really important when we start filtering and you know, looking at plants and looking at what we're looking to buy, having this lens because essentially whatever you're introducing, it may be just to your yard, but there's a chance that you're going to introduce it on a larger scale. Um, I think uh, 
we recently identified an invasive grass up by Clark Lake called Johnson grass, and it actually got named by the guy who introduced it. Um, so that's kind of great. He uh, introduced an invasive grass and got his name on it. Uh, so, I mean, that doesn't typically happen, but you don't want to be the next Johnson grass guy. Um, and when we think about, you know, these characteristics, uh, one of the ones that I always find really uh, disheartening as uh, my husband's an avid birder, uh, and I have now been dragged begrudgingly along, um, and now I'm kind of getting invested in birds, is that number seven, fruit is abundant and attractive to animals, even if it negatively impacts them. So one of the ones that when we think of is buckthorn. Buckthorn actually acts as a diuretic to a lot of our migratory birds, songbirds, and it's one of the contributing factors to them not making it to their final migratory destination in the south. Um, and that is such a sad piece of knowledge. Um, and it's really, uh, it's kind of one of the things that is hard to stomach. Um, because again, birds are just like people or anything else. They're going to eat whatever they prefer. Uh, I think I oftentimes compare invasive plants to junk food. So, uh, you know, people know, you know, eating fast food is probably not the best for them. And lo and behold, you drive by McDonald's and the line's super long. Um, and it is one of those things that it's, even if they, I don't know if the birds necessarily know better, I don't know how to communicate with the birds, I wish I did, um, but it is really disheartening when you start thinking about that, especially because uh, buckthorn seeds start showing up right now in the fall as they're making their migratory routes. Um, so, now we've introduced all these bad news. I told you we're gonna get to good news, but we're gonna touch on a few more pieces of kind of bad news as we talk about how can we play a productive role in helping prevent the introduction of invasives. And so um, we're not really necessarily talking about true prevention. We're talking about you guys being kind of citizen science, scientists in your own backyard and recognizing something that may be problematic. Um, a great example of it is yellow archangel. This is not listed under NR40. It is not a regulated plant. It is oftentimes sold in plant nurseries. I see it, I think, in every plant nursery I've been in, in Door County. Uh, they are debating listing it. So again, keep in mind that invasive species plant list changes every five years. So you may buy something this year, and next year you may have me knock on your door going, you have to kill that. Uh, and you'll be like, what? I spent how much money on that? Um, and trust me, it's not a conversation I enjoy, and it's probably not a conversation you guys enjoy having with me. Um, and so when we talk about these plants, Yellow Archangel, this is actually uh, a really nice landowner had reached out to me and said, hey, uh, I've been buying this yellow archangel every year. It's at my summer home. I love it. I put it in a planter out front, and then fall rolls around. I'm going to go back to my, my winter home. Uh, I just dump the plants out along the road edge. I don't think twice about it. And I've started noticing uh, it's taking over. And I said, excuse me, what's going on? <laughs> uh, and so I went, and uh, when he said taking over, we were talking. Um, more than 10 acres are dominated oh, with yellow archangel in the understory. Wow. And so, great on him for reaching out. And it's one of those things you have to see something and say something. So this is being used as a case study right now with the DNR for if yellow archangel should be listed. And even if it's not listed, as people who are invested in our land, you should really be thinking, you know, ah, oh, this could be a problem. And there's a lot of species out there. Um, another great example of this is blue sea holly. Um, this is actually a picture of my wedding bouquet. I love blue sea holly. It is, I had it in my wedding bouquet, I had it in my front garden bed, I have primarily native plants, and I thought, oh, this is just a stunning plant. This is one of my favorites. Um, I was really deliberate, I really wanted it, my wedding bouquet, I was really invested, and I started noticing it's seeding out. It's taking over parts of my lawn. Oh my gosh, it's taking over parts of my garden bed. I gotta kill this. And I, I, it was actually funny, for our wedding anniversary, that's what I ended up doing. <laughs> I uh, ceremoniously killed our, our blue sea holly. Um, and it, it is not listed under NR40, but it is one of those ones where, again, when you start looking at what those characteristics are, all I was thinking is, great, I need to be the next person who's introduced a terrible invasive to Door County. That'd be uh, not something I would be super proud of, and it also wouldn't be something that I'd be really excited about. Um, and so this is again one of those things where it's really discouraging and it's really hard, but it's always important when you're looking at your landscape to think, 
is this potentially problematic? And then it gets more complicated from there when you start talking about climate change. Okay, I said it's going to get more positive. We're going to go a little bit more sad for a few minutes. Um, so when we talk about climate change, right now some of the plant species you have in your yard might be fine. They might be staying put. They might be doing what they're supposed to. Um, for those of you who are master gardeners, if you remember your five-leaf acebia vine that um, was, uh, it's now gone. Um, <laughs> it's been killed. Uh, but that five-leaf acebia vine uh, in Door County, it wasn't showing true invasive species qualities, but they were starting to notice in Madison and southern Wisconsin that it was spreading easily, spreading through seed and spreading through rhizome. It was creating all the big red flags of this is a really big problem. And uh, when we got wind of it, and it was one of those things, it may not be a problem right now, but I don't want to wait, you know, 10 years now and go, oh my gosh, we have created a disaster. We have created that monster from, uh, I'm trying to think of the, uh, the Feed Me Seymour plants from yeah, Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, when we think about this, even in our own backyards, you know, there might be plants that are okay right now in our own backyards, but as temperatures change, uh, rain patterns change, temperatures change. It's really important. Again, we are living through times that um, we don't really know. You know, a lot of invasive species management is why we go through all these changes every five years. A lot of this is us trying to do what we can with the best science. And actually, the best science really relies on citizen science and people being invested in their properties. And so uh, I like to think of master gardeners. Uh, people who are really invested in the ecology of Door as being kind of our first bell ringers, um, letting us know what's going on and trying to communicate the best we can. And even if uh, state legislation or other things don't support us, we can still make actionable items and make things work. Um, so that's my little soapbox. I hope you guys appreciate it. Um, this is where we get into the positive stuff now. Um, so uh, when we talk about, again, this invasion curve, we're now going to talk in this category of persistence. So you think this persistence category should be really sad. This is essentially where an invasive species has successfully become part of the environment. We have no chance of getting rid of it. It is here to stay. Bloom and deal. So uh, when we think about that, I always like to talk about the round goby. Uh, it was introduced in the 1990s. Um, and this is, we're talking about um, in aquatic situation, and this is a horrible food web, but it is the only one I could find really quick. So I'm just going to roll with that. Um, but the round goby was originally introduced, and it was uh, right around the same time that uh, DDT was banned, uh, and quagga mussels were introduced, introduced in zebra mussels. And so you're thinking, how do these all go hand in hand? And it uh, weirdly does. Um, so when we think about our native cormorants, um, their eggs started to actually become viable. In the 1980s, cormorants were on the brink of extinction, uh, which is kind of crazy to think about because you look out at the water and cormorants are, I don't know, I guess my, my husband terms them as rats with wings. Um, <laughs> they are everywhere. Uh, I used to only hear that for pigeons. So, um, so right around this time, the zebra mussels and quagga mussels were introduced, and so they were increasing the rates of filter feeding. And then round gobies were introduced and destroying bass nests. And so bass populations were starting to drop. Along with the increased rates of water clarity, we were starting to see a lot of our fish populations decrease as cormorant populations were starting to rebound and they were able to dive deeper because they were able to see deeper. And then we also started seeing, with the introduction of the round goby, a lot of that food um, base that a lot of our fish populations were dependent on were going for round goby. And so, Essentially, a lot of people were panicked, uh, and they don't blame. But then we started seeing weird things happening. Round goby was able to focus and start predating on young zebra and quagga mussels, which is really weird. And Bass, in turn, said, OK, I guess you're eating my eggs. I'll eat you. And so we started seeing the round goby becoming incorporated in the system. And the same thing with zebra and quagga mussels. They've created such a impact the system that it is forever changed. And so the question is, how do we keep going and not have any new species introduced, but really we're kind of at a point where we can't pull them out of the system. They've become incorporated. And 
they've also helped stabilize certain populations, which is also a really weird concept. Um, and so, again, the round goby is still in the process of what I like to say, becoming incorporated into our environment. Um, and aquatic systems tend to be a little bit more resilient than what we see in terrestrial systems. And it also may be the fact that there's still a lot unknown in the aquatic systems. But kind of a good news-ish, bad news-ish story with the introduction of them. One of my favorite stories, uh, and this is in the American Southwest, um, is donkeys. Uh, so in the American Southwest, uh, if you've been paying attention to the news, they are in chronic droughts, wildfires. Uh, it's really problematic. Water is very scarce. And uh, in the 1500s, the Spanish said, I'm going to bring horses and donkeys out to the Southwest and let them go. Uh, they didn't know about invasive species. They didn't really think about what that could do. They just, sure, why not? Um, and so in um, the... They had a lot of negative impacts to um, a lot of our like uh, herd species. There's a lot of problems. There was a lot of management going towards it. And as we got more and more into these drought and fire conditions, water was becoming more and more scarce. And weirdly, donkeys can smell water, something I did not know. Um, and they can smell water. And now they're being turned as ecosystem engineers. They are creating the last vestiges for these specific wild plants that are on the brink of extinction by essentially creating these little oases by digging for water, which is super weird. And now they're going, all of our historic plans of trying to kill and eradicate these invasive species, now we can't because they're kind of important to the system that has forever changed. <laughs> And again, we're looking at time scale, right? We're talking 500 years on a terrestrial scale level. Um, and this is just fairly recently. I believe these studies were just published in uh, 2019, 2018. Um, and so, again, the thought process when we talk about faces is not necessarily eradication. I think a lot of people think eradication is king. Eradication is not king. We are trying to incorporate what we can and make it so our native species can thrive and that we can kind of all do that kumbaya thing. But it's going to take time. And it's on a time scale that oftentimes I think people find very unsatisfying. Uh, it's going to be one of those things where I always joke that I'm going to chase my tail until the day I retire and until the day I die. And, uh, you know, maybe my great great grandchildren are going to end up being like, oh, now this is, you know, native and non native frag can hold hands and work well together. Um, and so when we talk about invasive species management, it's really important to acknowledge that certain species are kind of, they're here. They're here to stay and we just have to figure out how we can incorporate them into the system and how we can preserve the species we have and preserve the richness and diversity. Um, and it's one of those things that uh, I think that's actually kind of good news, right? Um, our world is constantly changing. Our systems are constantly changing. and. Oftentimes, uh, I think people like to think stagnantly. So I think everyone goes, this is what I knew in my childhood, so this is what it has to be. And no, that's not true. The environment and everything around us is a very dynamic system. One of Door County's most prized ecological places is our ridge and swale habitat. And that is such a dynamic system, such a need of constant changes. And so I think, um, it's always fun to think on a time scale. It's to think that we are just a hiccup in time. So uh, Ridge and Swale is uh, actually what the Ridge's Sanctuary is kind of named after. Um, and so if you go and you look at aerial images of the Ridge and Swale habitat up in Bailey's Harbor, you can see these very distinct kind of, they're like these rolling hills. And um, it, that whole system is based actually on coastal Lake Michigan ebbing and flowing and creating these erosion and deposition events. It's very cool and it's a uh, time scale again. Um, you know, some of those dunes are so old, but like, it's a little mind boggling. And so it, um, when we talk about restoration and we talk about invasives and we talk about kind of moving forward, I think it's always, uh, I find it reassuring to think time scale wise, you know, we got to do the best we can with the best information we can. And even when we talk about climate change modeling, that's based off specific modeling. You know, you could talk to me next year and I might say, oh, that's changed. Something happened, you know, something crazy. Uh, and everything is based off of modeling and what we have right now, the best information. And so um, I think that's always a really important piece of information when we talk about 
uh, invasive species and restoration. Um, one of those species that I always like to talk to people about is yarrow. A lot of people always talk to me, yarrow's native. Not really, but that's okay. Uh, yarrow can actually form dense monocultures. It's not native. Um, it was originally introduced in the colonial times. It is native to Europe and Asia, just like most of the bases are. Um, but it has and does serve an important ecological role in our ecosystem now. And, you know, I included this because I felt like donkeys were a great example of like an invasive that then became like a champion. Uh, Yarrow is not necessarily a champion, it's just like a good thing. Yeah, you know, it's kind of okay, that's cool. Um, but I think it's really important to recognize we are just kind of biding our time and trying to create enough space for our native species to become resilient. And so, this is where backyard complexity steps in. Um, I really wish these pictures were better because these are actually pictures from my backyard. Um, so, me and my husband bought our property and one of the things we said is we wanted to plant native species. And so, we live in the middle of the city of Sturgeon and we were like, you know, we aren't going to get anything good in it, but we'll just see what happens. And so we started planting native plants. And so we did Mies Hissa, uh, Maximilian Sunflower, Bergamot, or um, Bee Balm, Michigan Lily, Wood Violet, uh, we did Trillium, so we did a variety of Viburnums, we did Dogwood, Ironweed, uh, Great Blue Lobelia, Sneezeweed, uh, we let Aster show up. I know oftentimes a lot of uh, gardeners really hate Daisy Fleabane. I love Daisy Fleabane. Um, all of these plants grew really robustly, really aggressively with one, one another, and created this like kind of beautiful chaos that I love. Some of my neighbors are probably sure were like, what is wrong with her? Um, but I loved it. And one of the benefits we saw is some of our neighbors had garlic mustard. Some of our neighbors had things that weren't really what we wanted. They had buckthorn. They had things that I was like, that should stay over there, please. And we started seeing a lot of our native plants, even if the garlic mustard came in, were able to outcompete if you're able to give them the space. And so that's the idea is you want to plant for diversity. You can't just have one giant dense monoculture of a single native plant because if a disease comes through or something that's able to outcompete it, you aren't going to see it be resilient. So you kind of want to embrace, I call it cottage gardening. That's how I'm selling it, and that's the way I'm going to roll with it. Um, but it's really important to kind of let that happen. And you end up seeing that diversity. And what we ended up seeing was our insect population took off. I have so many pictures of different types of bumblebees, metallic sweat bees. Uh, we have different types of wasps. Uh, we have uh, the bee mimics. We have butterflies. We have hummingbirds. Uh, we have hummingbird moths. And then we started seeing our bird populations take off. And again, this was a span of like less than three years. We started seeing huge changes. We had red-headed woodpeckers nesting in our backyard. We had a successful clutch of wood ducks. Again, I'm in the city of Sturgeon Bay. Like, there's no way that they should be just showing up. Um, we had goldfinches, pine siskins, chickadees, red poles, juncos, you name it. We had so many things going on in our backyard, it was a little overwhelming. And our dogs started getting really interested in the little songbirds, and we had to be like, calm down, buddy, you can't chase them. Uh, still didn't, you know, we've been working on that. Um, we had purple finches, we had all sorts of sparrows. It was fantastic. And then, that picture at the top, that was right outside our bay window. We had a sharp-shinned hawk who started coming in every day during the winter, hanging out. And he wouldn't go, like, he would just let him hang out with us, like, he wouldn't care. Uh, he was hunting for all those little birds that were hanging out. Uh, we had, um, right after I gave birth to my son, I had a great horned owl camp out. Uh, we were so amazed at what the diversity, again, in three years, our little backyard that was just a turf lawn, all of a sudden started supporting all this wildlife. And it was a treat for us. I mean, again, it may not be as everyone's aesthetic, but I think it goes back to if you are able to cultivate that diversity, that richness, you are able to build a more robust system. We also saw the garlic mustard sometimes creeps in on the fringes, but there's not a lot of heavy management. And it's one of those things that we're actually really excited to see. And we also are embracing how our systems are changing. And so, you know, we plant some things and some things don't take, and that's sad. 
but you know, something else comes in and half the time uh, I feel like we're always betting on what that new seedling is that's popping up. Uh, I tend to be right. Um, <laughs> but it's really exciting, I think, from a backyard standpoint. Um, oftentimes gardeners don't realize that importance of native species and also realize, like, you could, you know, we have like less than a half acre lot in the middle of the city of Sturgeon where like we are surrounded by cement. Like there's no way we should have the diversity in what we have going on in our backyard. And it is a treat. And if, you know, people could take the time. And also, management wise, I don't have to do a lot. Like I love that. Uh, I'm a very lazy gardener. Um, and so I think that's very cool. And so when we talk about uh, native plants, it's always really fun to kind of take time and you know, call out certain ones that we love. Um, some are not necessarily truly native to door, and some are, and some are actually state listed. Uh, so um, the prickly pear, uh, I said I really wanted one. It's not technically truly native to door. It's actually native to Wisconsin, though, but um, I still love it, and it's flowering. Well, it was flowering. And then we have our nodding onions, which are native to door, and they are, I feel like, oftentimes the unsung heroes in prairies. Uh, they don't get I feel like you don't get to see them, they're not super tall. But they're very cool when you stumble across them. Uh, the Michigan lily is a stunning lily, it's native. Oftentimes I feel like everyone goes after Easter lilies or other things, I'm like, we have a beautiful one, why not just plant that? It's so cool. Um, and then lance leaf coreopsis, that's actually a state listed species, and it's a very cool plant, you can buy it locally, um, and it supports a whole bunch of different pollinators, native pollinators. And then we can talk about showy penstemon. Uh, you know, again, everyone wants to plant foxglove. We have a native foxglove that's super pretty. Like, why not embrace that? Um, bone set is another one that I feel oftentimes people go, oh, that's just kind of a weird little fluffy white flower. It's a stunning plant, and it also supports a whole bunch of different insects. And it's, um, there's something crazy to walking out in your own backyard and also hearing the life in your backyard, hearing the soft buzz of everything going on. Um, jewel weed is one that I feel most often than not a lot of landowners view as a nuisance and really annoying. But actually, this is one that produces, um, if you crush up the stem, it produces essentially an anti oil to poison ivy. So, if you know you go through poison ivy, if you can find jewel weed, rub it on yourself and you're all set. Uh, this was a favorite plant of mine as a kid. Uh, we used to call it the popper plant because the seeds, when you pinch them, they shoot seeds everywhere. They're really fun. Uh, it's one of my favorites. And then hoary vervain. Uh, hoary vervain spreads through seed. It's really stunning. It's these beautiful uh, purple flowers. And the flowers creep up as the uh, flowers themselves get pollinated. And so it's really fun. I like to play with it. And then um, oftentimes when I talk with landowners, I oftentimes hear, we don't have any true native ground covers that are good. Like, oh, no, that's not true at all. You just don't know where to look. Uh, May apple is fantastic. And it's also a native plant that we oftentimes overlook. Um, you know, we can talk about spring ephemerals. Yes, they are around all the time, but trout lily is one of my favorites, the first sign of spring that gets my heart really excited. Uh, and then uh, bearberry. Oftentimes, I think most people don't think about this. This is a low-growing, woody plant. It has these lovely, sweet little pink flowers on it, and it also produces fruit that are really important for our native mammals as well as birds. Um, and it grows as a dense, uh, ground cover, and I think it's I think it's really stunning. And then, of course, I feel like I had to include some shrubs because I was realizing it's really flower heavy. Um, but shadbush, shadbush is amazing. And uh, if you're lucky enough, uh, after a few frosts, you'll end up seeing, seeing cedar waxwings around, getting drunk off the berries, uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, and these piss hop is another one of my favorites. It self sows itself in my garden constantly. Uh, Rosa blanda is our native rose. Again, I feel like everyone always totes um, with these non-native roses. And I always want to be like, have you seen our native roses? They are stunning, and they are robust, and uh, they hold up really well to powdery mildew and other things, so they tend to be less of a headache. And then um, highbush cranberry. Uh, this is one I think more often than not, it can be really annoying for some people, but I think it has value. And the crazy thing is the berries are really high in vitamin C. So you won't see birds or mammals really prioritizing it until we hit that polar vortex, super cold winter, where they can't get anything else. This becomes a really important staple for them. Uh, and so you'll see the berries, they'll sit and you go, oh, this is really disappointing and kind of gross. And then 
there'll be that one day in winter when you look out, like, oh, everything's on it now. And that is a really cool feature. <coughs> Sorry. And then big blue stuff. I had to include some grass. I was debating which grass, and I really wanted to do big blue. I love big blue. Uh, I think it is a stunning bunch of grass, and I think oftentimes, um, I think a lot of people sometimes can get intimidated. And I think it's important to always include grasses and do a mixture in your own yard because, again, something birds prefer. Uh, so they prefer, you know, oftentimes the berries and the seeds. But then you can also have small mammals that become really dependent. Uh, my husband and myself, we were really lucky. We had a mink in our backyard, which was really exciting. However, it did eat all of our chickens. So it's a 50 50. But, um, again, when you have species that are diverse and you're able to support a variety of wildlife, including, I know a lot of people don't like our small rodents, but they do serve a purpose. They are part of that food chain. And so it's really important when we talk about all of this to have that larger picture. And in return, you can end up, you know, replacing your TV with, what the heck is going on outside? Uh, and with that, that's my kind of good news, and I hope that you guys enjoyed that. <laughs> soil and water, so I work for the county, um, which is a weird, I know it's a weird thought, kind of, uh, but we end up working really heavily with municipalities, and the hard thing is with existing species. Uh, for instance, the county building has a mere maple planted outside, which is an invasive maple, uh, and it's one of the things that I always see and curse every morning when I walk into work, uh, but it is one of the things that, um, where, again, it depends on where it is in that restricted, prohibited category. But we are working with municipalities, and there's a lot of interest now to do a lot more native. So a lot of the newer plantings, they're focusing on native plantings or those truly ornamental plantings. Um, I think when the city did the installation uh, down by the bridge, um, I forget what park that is, but um, with the water fountain, uh, they ended up doing a whole bunch of different natives as well as truly ornamental plants in hopes that they're going to be slowly changing that mindset. And so there are a lot of, unfortunately, invasive trees. So I think Norway maple is a great one. If you walk through the city of Sturgeon Bay, you see Norway maple everywhere. Siberian elm is everywhere. Um, and it is just, it, you kind of have to take it chunk by chunk because uh, um, nobody has infinite resources. And so we work um, pretty closely with municipalities, providing them with guidance as much as we can. And then, uh, for those prohibited species uh, to help protect, well not protect, but to make sure that everyone feels good about a situation, um, we kind of step in so the DNR isn't giving you guys an instant fine. Uh, so if you instead get greeted by my smiling face and going, hey, I really want to work with you to kill that. Uh, and then we kind of have to go through that motion. And so we help spearhead uh, some of the more abrupt enforcement that comes from the state. Um, and that way we actually see a lot more success. Uh, Door County, the Door County Invasive Species Team was founded in 2001, um, and NR40, so the Invasive Species Law, was passed in 2011. So Door County has been saying invasives have been a problem for well over a decade before the state said, oh, I guess it is a problem, I guess we should do something. So um, I think that is a testament truly to our residents as well as our tourists too, who are invested in having a long-term view of how do we keep this place this special. Yeah. I have a question about converting lawns. Yeah. Can you like um, do the no-till drill and just put a bush here and a plant there or do you have to really get rid of all the turf? It, it depends. I know that's a really unsatisfying answer. Um, okay. So uh, lawns, I was actually trying to look up what uh, is in a traditional Scots lawn 
package for this presentation because I was like, this should be easy. You know, I could find this somewhere, right? No, it's really hard to find what their special recipe is. Um, but there are certain grasses that tend to be a little bit more robust. And so when we talk about um, prairies overall, so uh, if you guys know where the Justice Center is for um, Door County, they have a beautiful prairie, um, but it's being dominated by cool season grasses. So cool season grasses tend to be your poas, uh, the species that you see in lawns. Uh, and so they end up kind of out-competing a lot of our, they can't out-compete natives. Um, and they have a much shallower root system, so they end up trying to smother, um, which is really annoying. So uh, it really depends on what your lawn is comprised of. Some lawns I go to and I'm like, this is a great lawn. You have just violets. Like, uh, and some people, if they've had a long history of trying to maintain a lawn, um, there may be uh, more of a different root base or a seed base. And so it really depends. Um, but if you're trying to shade it out, so if you're trying to embrace like a forested setting or a shrub setting, you may be able to get away with just planting into it. Um, but if you wanted to plant into like do a prairie or you know some of the herbaceous, you may have some problems. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Sam. Oh. I'm gonna go sure. this way. Sure. Yeah. Um, in, ter in, in terms of eradicating invasive species, do you see more luck with chemical treatments versus like physically pulling them? Or it depends. I, I feel like I'm gonna say this a lot. It depends. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, this summer uh, we found European frog bit. Uh, and European frog bit is a prohibited invasive floating leaf plant that came in from Michigan. Uh, it was first detected last year in Oconto and Marinette. And because the way the currents are in the bay, it shot over to Little Sturgeon and Fish Creek. And we were part of an effort with the Wisconsin DNR trying to detect what the heck's going on. And we ended up finding these small populations. And so in that case, I just had like a little potato sack and you just kind of pick it up and put it in the potato sack. Uh, and that, that sounds more glamorous than I think what it was, but essentially mechanical worked great for that situation. Um, we have other situations where it depends on soil type. So um, we've before, uh, where we have to be really aware of um, a lot of our sensitive species in sandier soils. So I'm thinking along Lake Michigan. Uh, we found that actually pulling Phragmites is actually more successful sometimes. But we've also found if the population is large and dense, and that you, you aren't really worried about what's going on around it, herbicide is the better option. And so there's a lens, um, and even the herbicide you use is also based on location, what's going on, uh, if the plant species has been treated in the past in that same location. Uh, there's like a lot of information that kind of goes into the decisions. Um, and it kind of makes it fun a little bit. It also makes it a, be a management nightmare, but yeah. Yeah. Question: um, Is there some resource that we can access to find a list of pictures of invasive species that we can then be aware of them? And yeah. on the other side, is there some thing for native species? Or yeah. Is there, I mean, and how would we do that? How, how yeah. We... So there is uh, the doorinvasives.org website, um, and that's a website I manage. And I think most of the links should be working. Uh, I feel like oftentimes UW moves them on me, and so sometimes links break. But um, we have uh, resources from the Door County Land Trust to the Nature Conservancy to the state to the feds. Um, and there is, we have most common species that you find in Door County. And then we also have kind of the list of, these are ones that we know are not far off on the horizon for us, so keep an eye out for them. And then we also have resources on these are native plants or these are resources or places you can look to, to identify native plants. So um, how would we remember your website? We uh, have, didn't have to write anything down. Yeah, there, really. um, what I can do is... Do so you have a, a website? Or, I mean, yeah. Google, when we Google. Yeah, if you just, I think if you just Google Door Invasives or Door, or Door County Invasive Species Team, um, or you can also, I'm pretty sure you could Google my name and find all the stuff. Um, all right, I'll, also sh I'll share it with Coggin. Oh, yeah, I think you guys have it on, yeah, you can post it on, I think it's on Crossroads website. Uh, probably not, but. Okay. Um, 
But Mr. Yeah, Gardner's it's not hard. It's not hard to find it. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Gardner's. Mr. Gardner's, I think. I think Smith. Yeah, I think yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah, and so I, I think you can. It's shared pretty widely. Also, if you just look at Invasive Species Store County, um, even if you come across the DNR website, they have a link to our website. So, yeah. Yes. Okay, so the garden door. We yeah. have a we have a lot of the blue sea holly. Yeah. Should we be proactive and start taking that out? I would say yes, but I also don't want to break any hearts. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who's heart, I think the bigger heartbroken was the akebia vine. But yeah. any, <laughs> I mean, so it's not listed. You aren't required to do anything, mm -hmm. but it is one of the ones where um, the nice thing is the mess. The, door, uh, uh, the garden door is really well managed, so you guys are there and active. And the nice thing is, um, being surrounded by the Ag Research Station, you're kind of contained. Mm -hmm. um, one of the bigger headaches is like if you are a private property, you know, landowner, and you abut state natural area, or you are abutting, um, you know, like a waterway or something where there's a lot more uh, conductivity throughout the site. Um, it's one of those things that you should be really cautious of. And I think for the garden door, um, you guys could just keep an eye on it. Or, um, or if you want, I could ceremoniously show up in a wedding dress and help pull it. <laughs> but it was, yeah. Uh, it was one of the ones that we started noticing that was a problem, at least for us. Um, but again, it also could be our backyard and what we were seeing. Because also it could be we have different soil series or other things. And so that's the part where. Uh, a lot of invasive species and gaining knowledge of what's going on is kind of starting with you guys, the public. You guys noticing things and being out there and going, oh, I saw this being a problem and I, you know, I have sandy soils so that took off. Or, oh, this did not grow well at all. That's fine. Um, it's really hard to create generalizations sometimes. Uh, certain plants we do see, they can grow anywhere. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. How do you kill Lily in the valley? <laughs> yeah, it's gonna say a lot of uh, sweat and tears. Um, it is one of the nastier ones. You can use. There are some herbicides that can work okay, but if you want to try and preserve, if you have other things growing nearby, it can be really hard. Um, and oftentimes, when we talk about herbicides. Uh, what you buy at Ace Hardware or um, Walmart or whatever, um, it's not the same herbicide that like we buy like a 50% concentrate and we mix it up to the ratios that we need and it's really expensive. Um, but that way, uh, it's hard if you're doing low dosages. So oftentimes, like the commercial Roundup that you buy like right off the shelf, uh, that's like a one or two percent and oftentimes it's not strong enough or it doesn't have the right surfactant, which is the added, um, it's kind of the added binder that helps keep uh, the chemical applied. It also makes the chemical wetter, is how I like to describe it, so it allows it to spread out more evenly on the surface. Um, and so what we sometimes see is if landowners are using that kind of lower dose herbicide, they can end up creating an herbicide resistance in that plant rather than like, it's kind of like you'd have to go all in or not. Um, and I know that's a really, uh, yeah, it's a tough spot to be in. But I can have some piece of resources.